How was the uh, league yesterday, Raven? I do want to join you sometime. All right, here's a question. Once you buy something, do you own it? Like, do you really own it? Like, you can do whatever you want. Not what you're expecting. A Marquise Brownlee video. It sounds Very like tired a question, of but there actually my, are like I said, a lot of limits Good on to you. what exactly you can do with what you own. How long did you stream for? So let's say you buy a car. You get the title. It's yours. You own it. You can do whatever. Go drive it somewhere, wherever you want to go. But you also can't drive over certain speeds in certain places. So that's a limit that we understand. We get it. There's safety reasons. Uh, or let's say you buy a printer. You own that photocopier. You guys should go uh, follow Raven, by the way. You can do whatever you want with it. Put it in whatever room you want. Put it on whatever table you want to do. Start printing stuff. Sounds okay. good. But you know what kept on playing. I understand that. Photocopying money. Sometimes it just nice doesn't let you. Turn off the stream. You try. Well, don't try. But it'll actually stop you. You can't do that. And there are good reasons for that. So there are certain limits that we've actually accepted for things that we own. And so one of those limits that's been talked about quite a bit lately that's worth shining a light on is right to repair. So if you own something and it breaks, should you be allowed to repair it and fix it? Honestly, that should be a pretty easy yes across the board. There's no problem with that. And no one's going to stop you if you try Remember to do it. Remember, we talked no about this. It, um, but it's almost impossible with, to actually uh, do it. The tractors and John Deere before. And I think it's interesting when you kind of like bring it down to this level too with like cell phones and things. Let's talk about that. So, right to repair. Now, I actually think it's a little bit of a misleading name or a little confusing just because you actually are allowed to repair the thing you own. There's no law against that. But How are you doing today, it's the Andy? companies that make the things that we're often trying to repair that are trying to stop you before you even get that far. So here is the, the main crux of the right to repair conversation right think, now. Think, right? Mark, think. You buy a thing, right? A piece of tech, a phone, you own it, you use it, and then part of it breaks. Let's say your screen breaks. That's pretty common. There are two versions of what you think should happen at this point, depending on who you are. There's the user side, there's the manufacturer side. So I'm just gonna start with the user side because it should be the easiest to understand. You should just be able to pop off the broken screen, buy a new screen, put it on, repair it, and still keep using that I thing. I agree. Of course you should be able to repair the item you own. Especially with so much monopolization on um, products themselves where we don't have as much choice. Uh, we, you know, we talk about um, uh, uh, this, th this goes down to why we need regulations, right? Like we talk about like fully unhinged capitalism. Uh, big thing that we get is monopolies. And then they put this monopoly on the technology, the code. That's what we were talking about with the John Deere tractors, right? It's that they had a monopoly on the script. Uh, and that's why they couldn't just repair it. And then there's this kind of like, if you do repair it, then they uh, basically won't cover it anymore. Any other type of repair on that item. Great reasons why. Repair. And even save. with the smallest things, but like the cell phone is the one of the biggest things that you use all the time in your life. Like, you know, that's where we're at. I mean, personal assistance and stuff like that. Me knowing how to fix most electronics makes it the impossible user money, to use of course. the skill. So to stick with the phone example, if just the screen is broken. What do you mean? That makes it impossible to use the skill. Oh, and like the entire rest like of the phone is still like functional. This? Then it's way cheaper to replace the screen than to buy a whole new phone, of course. But also, it saves the environment. So instead of creating unnecessary e-waste, throwing out a perfectly usable thing because one broken part, we can right. make a meaningful change to this throwaway economy that so many of us live in. Just keep using the thing as long as it works. And also the fact is not everybody needs brand new phones. So if you someday want to upgrade to a new phone, somebody else can benefit from that used phone with and probably think about all the ways that we've parts. gone through That's with way better phones. than throwing the whole thing out. So the fact is the more easily replaceable and repairable parts that are in our gadgets, the better it is for the user. For the user. And as you can probably imagine, that means that the manufacturers, the companies that are making these things are on the complete opposite side of that equation. They're gonna want control. So I'm gonna use Apple as the example here, right? So they make this iPhone, business 101, right? Once they sell you this iPhone, sure, you yeah, do. Yeah, they make it more difficult than it needs to be to purchase repair parts. Instead, you have to send it in 
hope they don't send you back a worse refurbished version. Yeah, exactly. You're at the behest of the company, especially like, you know, I've, you know, I've had Google Pixel and stuff like that. And, they, you know, I, I've done it before with like refurbishing and stuff. And it's, you know, it's convenient, but who knows what you're getting back. Uh, sometimes you have to pay these hefty fees if you didn't have the insurance. It's just you own it, but their lot of money best interest to like, is to retain as much control over this iPhone as they possibly yeah. can, because everything about this transaction Which is means better more for them money if they have instead more of you just so going you to a repair shop. It's like how, why Macs too are so like top down, like in the same patented technology and whatnot, making it so that they're one of the only besides some outlets able to like work on their shit hey and only iphone sure but if apple controls the I mean, accessory market this, as much as they can they can keep selling Mac you accessories and, and taking a cut a of everything example. made for iphone so they can continue Mac. making money off of the thing they sold you this is literally called the mfi program made for iphone if apple controls the services that mm -hmm. run on the iphone they can make their own work the best and they can keep selling you even more of those things and making even more money off of that one iPhone purchase. And if it breaks, Apple would also like to be the ones to sell you the repairs by keeping as much control over that ecosystem as possible. Honestly, in Apple's dream world, there probably are no independent repair shops at all, right? You can't you can't have people getting in and replacing parts in their precious iPhones, you know? They if someone does the instructions wrong, maybe they they repair something incorrectly and then it doesn't work or they get counterfeit parts and they don't even know they're not using real iPhone parts or maybe they use a weird third-party battery that has problems later down the line. Like it's too much. So, if Apple has all of the control here, then they eliminate all those possible variables. But you can't control everything, Apple. That would be a monopoly, actually. So, and you can probably see where this is going, Apple yeah. would like to offer you a choice. You can choose to become an Apple certified repair shop. Only the Apple certified mm -hmm. shops have access to Apple's training, official documentation, and the ability to buy official parts straight from Apple to do the best possible repairs. But, you have to pay a fee to Apple to become certified, and you have to log everything, and now there are lots of limits actually to the types of repairs you're even allowed to make. It's to the point really? where it would actually be yeah, a bad business decision for a lot of these independent shops that already exist to become Apple certified because yeah. it would limit so much of what Buying they were these trying bad to Apple do. products to reuse them. Lewis Rossman, you might've heard of him, technician, educator, guy with a YouTube channel in New York City. He's made videos talking about this. Listen to him describe all the potential downsides of potentially joining that program in one of his videos. As I mentioned in a follow-up video, this program is virtually useless because they put a lot of barriers in place to keep new people from being able to sign up. It seems like it's intentionally designed to be difficult. The prices for screens were not great. For the iPhone 6 and 6S, they're charging more for the screen than a customer can purchase a phone for. And above all, they don't do anything besides batteries and screens. So a charge port, no, batteries and screens. Your microphone or earpiece doesn't work, nope, just batteries and screens. You have a problem with your mm -hmm. MacBook, I'm sorry, we only cover iPhone batteries and screens. It is a virtually worthless program. A, repair shops have to agree to unannounced audits and inspections by Apple to determine if they're using prohibited repair components, which can result in fines. So I would be fined, most likely, prohibited for being able to fix motherboards in my premises by having access to chips that and Apple the, doesn't the want me to have. The bullshit is, too, that they put you on these fucking plans that you have to, you know, work off because they're, like, two grand or whatever. And then, you know, you get the repair benefits for them. But like afterwards, it's like, well, now it's just going to be more, a little bit more expensive. You know, like the longer that you keep it uh, when, you know, these things could last for a while. It's just. Being able to fix motherboard. It, like you're not even like allowed to own your phone at the end of the day because you still got to pay the service. You got to pay, you know in my premises by having access to chips that Apple doesn't want me to have access to so you can retain your data when I fix your board rather than have it replaced by Apple and erased. Even if a shop leaves the program, Apple can continue to inspect it for up to five years. <laughs> Imagine you have a job that requires drug testing and you quit the job and then they still try to enforce the drug testing for five years. Yeah. Yeah, clearly there are countless examples of Apple going the extra mile to prevent repairs on the iPhone. 
lawsuits, terrible contracts. Something else Lewis has actually talked about in his videos is Apple has been known to make small changes to an off-the-shelf oh, wow. part that they put into one of their products and then make a contract where that company that makes that thing cannot sell it to anyone other than Apple. And that might seem crazy at first, kind of is, but when you think about it from the perspective of a smaller manufacturer, Apple descends upon your campus and goes, we'd like to order 20 million of this chip, but you can't sell it to anyone else other than us. Well, with an order size that big, business sense says, all right, fine, they'll just do it. And so they do. Now, I'm just using Apple as an example here because they're easy to understand, but there are okay. a lot of other examples. It's not just Apple. All good. What up, Teleworks? Famously, John Deere, looking yes, at right, the tractor right company, to repair, has taken an extremely anti repair stance with it, their which tractors, is pretty cool. basically arguing farmers may own if those tractors. You guys don't know, but the software hard to imagine, that runs but on those Brownlee tractors is like one of the like very very big YouTuber is owned and copyrighted by John Deere. So when something breaks uh, and the like software that locks the farmer out of the tractor. Farmers have taken to hacking their tractors and literally digging into potentially pirated software to get around those software blocks and avoid dealing with the company so they can repair it themselves. It's been a whole mess. And even Tesla has notoriously very hard to get parts. And they just hate people messing with the insides of their cars. They constantly lock out attempted salvaged cars from the supercharger network and from software updates. They'll literally blacklist certain VIN numbers to prevent them from getting any more software. Now you could see how Tesla might argue that this is, it's, it's a safety thing. It's for safety reasons. We don't want people getting in those cars and making modifications because they could hurt themselves. In an old car, sure, pop open the hood, change some oil. But in a Tesla, it's way more complex. We don't want somebody messing with the battery and hurting themselves. So that's, that's an argument they can make. I actually thought about this when Simone Yetch made her truckload video where she modified a brand new Model 3 to a level I've never seen anyone else go to. She turned it into a pickup truck and made an incredible video about that process that you should watch if you haven't already. Okay, so what was what was the reaction she makes a lot uh, of cool from robotic Tesla shit. when you did all that? Like, did truckload get blacklisted? The, the, we, we, we were kind of building it with this like fear hanging over our head that there was going to be no, for sure. questions from Tesla. We um, should have, that they that's were what you're talking about. It's like they keep you, especially with this phone, like this phone, which I even have paid off, which is now getting older as it's a, um, as a, uh, a, a pixel three XL, but like, you know, things start to get slower or just, you know, it, we're at a point too, where like screen repair battery, like, Especially like what he was showing with like a disposable battery again, where we could like take it out and ha uh, put something back in. It, it's very much made so that it's, you know, last year's thing, you know, planned obsolescence, as everyone likes to say. Stop me from getting software updates, which would which, be really bad. You know, people um, like Apple or has that they would prevent like, me from admitted supercharging, to. which is kind of one of the like penalties they can give you if you're doing weird stuff. Right. Um, fortunately, none of that happened, and I think like. Yeah, the, the project got so much traction that it would like look really bad for them to go after me. But it's also like, I, I mean, I, I remember um, scheduling a service appointment because I wasn't, I had some software issues and the service tech before I came in called and was like, hey, no, exactly. I know who you are and I know what you've- Like we were talking about on Monday, if we can't do the radical right to repair, at least let me change my goddamn battery. Got to yeah, two <laughs> years is the standard in it. And I was so freaked out for sure. that I actually didn't go. And it's kind of weird that like and you're like you're doing your whole of... time paying it off, paying it off because it's not a cheap, um, it's not a cheap uh, buy, especially if you want like a decent phone, you know, or like the newest phone. The company. Part of me wants. They still make feature phones which have like the removable battery and stuff, and I thought about doing that. Punishing but no you one for wants doing that, right? something with their product. It's hard when, like especially when you want to connect the internet in an easy want. way and yeah. want this I, functionality. I the other side but they shouldn't own your wallet for like ever, or if you want to jump ship to someone else, like some other carrier or other phone, but still. And they, they try to like make barriers between that from this top down production, which makes it, albeit, and it is the trade off, nice and seamless. Like the fact that I can check my texts on my uh, PC or my Mac or something like that 
you get very much uh, comfortable within these um, these tech ecosystems. At least has back in the day when we had the pesky headphone jack, those were so annoying. I'm glad I have to buy a forty dollar dongle. Thank you for this amazing One innovation. Thing, which is safety. <laughs> So, you know, you had a lot of help and you had a team that was really skilled around you, but most True. people aren't going to be able out, to do like, really high too. quality modifications to their Tesla, you know? For sure. I mean, I, I, I think it's interesting because it's like the reasoning around locking it down so much is to keep people safe and for people to not do dangerous modifications. I think Truckless is probably like definitely in the realm of dangerous modifications. We did it as safely as we could and like we have every cross beam in the car and we had a really really skilled team it, but i get that they're like okay what if we give people free hands like they can kill themselves on this yeah and and you see that they kind of use it as a reason to prevent <laughs> even very small <laughs> listen with your headphones or charge your phone yeah pick one or like yeah, but we can do that or also like have uh, we can take away headphone jacks, but we can have it so your your phone itself, like the Samsung one, will charge another phone just by touching it. It's like small modification. That's the one that we're gonna use the most. These really dangerous things, so we can't even have them do these really basic things. And I think that's like it's all about control and it's about extending the time that you can earn money on a product that you've sold because if you control service and all the upgrades and everything then you can make sure that you can still earn money on a car that you sold seven years ago so i remember when i got into an accident with a truck in apollo my tesla model s and it was pretty rough like she was clearly going to need a bunch of new parts new doors, et cetera. You could tell that just looking at it. And I just remember it got to the point where there was a distinct choice that also, I Also boys, we gotta get followers, going 95, we're Literally there. any body shop in the area a, who would do their best in a few weeks or getting it towed an extra hour to that one I'll give Tesla you certified body shop. Goal. And they would have an extra long wait for official parts, but they would do their best for a perfect repair, literally to Tesla spec, where if a Tesla engineer looked at it, they couldn't tell it's replaced parts. And I chose that one. And that choice was a combination of, clearly I can't do it myself, it's far too complicated. But also, you know, the car was valuable enough to me that I didn't really want to risk it on a potentially subpar repair to save a few weeks or a few dollars. But that leads me to my number one overarching thought every time I think about right to repair in tech, which is that tech is getting very complicated. That's true though. So it is clear that but right then, to repair But, but at the same time, though, someone can still learn this stuff and not have to work for Mac and have, excuse me, small business uh, for uh, uh, repairing these items. So you can still be trained and not even, this still would open the gates for people without college degrees working in tech too. You know what I mean? Because right now, as it stands, as they said with Mac, Mac, Apple, fuck me. Um, with Apple, is uh, you have to be licensed by them, and they still have so much restrictions. Yes, it's still getting more complicated, but it still narrows and puts so much control on what this tech is. Is no matter what, someone can learn this without a, a, a I was going to say professional education, but I mean like a, not necessarily a college education, at least. Us, the users, you and me, right? We can see that. And we can also see that the manufacturers are on the other side of that equation. But something else I've noticed just in the tech world, and kind of everything is tech, but something I've noticed is as tech gets better, especially lately, it's getting more and more well optimized and more tightly integrated. Like parts are, are connected to each other more, they talk to each other faster. All the tech is getting better, but it's getting more well connected and more integrated. And so as that happens, it's all the tech is getting better. That's also making it less repairable at the same time, which makes sense, right? Because if things are more tightly integrated and you're fusing chips onto each other like that, that's just harder to disassemble and reassemble. 
it's harder to repair. Back in the golden age of a lot of tech products, maybe that's the 80s or the 90s or the early 2000s, they were at that height of repairability. Like if somebody broke a cassette tape player, people literally went in there with a screwdriver and could take it apart and get a part and replace it and put it back together and you're good. I actually literally managed to pull exactly that off in yeah, but the same thing. One. And that is now, true. Today, but more people are learning breaks, more and more code phones, though, like all the time. Glass, cracks. Look they at your literally phone. have like, apps to learn code. Most people don't know actually how to replace that themselves, but it's technically repairable. So if you go to the right place or the right people, they can remove the screen, replace it, and get it working again with new parts. So right now, right to repair is in this little hotspot bubble in the middle where with tech, tech keeps getting better and better and more and more well integrated. And at the same time, it's getting harder and harder to repair. Also getting more patents, which is like? such an it's issue kind of with a this. Crossroads. Does the future of tech trend to get so good that it's trending towards impossible to repair? Like look at these new M1 Macs. Apple's best Macs ever by far, right? I daily drive the M1 MacBook Pro at this point. They also just announced this ridiculously, stunningly thin 11 millimeter M1 iMac. And these machines are so good because the M1 system on a chip is more tightly integrated than ever. Like there is no Intel CPU that back in the day you could pop right. out and upgrade. There are no RAM sticks that you can just pop out and upgrade. There is no GPU that you can pop out and replace. Everything is built into this same chip sharing memory and it works amazingly well. So does a future of even better tech and faster tech mean a future of almost impossible repairs? Like that was my sticking point when I'm looking at right to repair in tech. Like that was hard to resolve in my mind. So I asked Lewis Rossman about this. And this is what he told me. It's a good question. I think that there's two different categories here. So there's the first category of repairs that are more difficult because of technological progress. And the second category are repairs that are more difficult because the manufacturer just, for lack of a better way to put it, just wants to be a dick. So <laughs> for instance, like with laptops, you used to have a fluorescent backlit screen, you know, like the fluorescent lights that you'd have, uh, you'd see in warehouses. And then they used LED. And that'll, instead of, they used to have an inverter board that was probably the size of this remote control that was sitting inside of every laptop. It was really easy to replace. You unplug a wire, you plug it back in, you can do this with your, with your hands, you don't even need small tools. Yeah. Then when the LED backlit screens came out, which were use less power, they're brighter, better color, uh, it, it was a small chip on the board that was soldered, QFN. And then it got even smaller, it was a ball grid array chip, where the chip has nine little solder balls or f f 25 solder balls under it, and you need a microscope and fancy equipment to solder it on there. I'm not suggesting with right to repair that we should go back to the Stone Age and use devices with black and white screens. The problem is not with it being smaller or harder to repair for me. Like that, that's my responsibility to figure out how to fix it as the technology gets better and smaller and more integrated. What the problem is, is it's not about like the large board becoming a tiny chip. It's when I knock on Texas Instruments door and say, I, you know, I'd like to buy a thousand of this chip. And they say, we can't sell it to you. The manufacturer told us we are not allowed to sell it to you. So yeah. one of the big criticisms of right to repair is, you know, I don't want to own a phone that looks like Gordon Gecko's in Wall Street. I don't, he, if, if Lewis had his way, everything would just have giant Phillips screws in it, like something, you know, where I hang on my wall. And that's not the case. Uh, I, I would obviously prefer the ability to replace the battery in my device without having to use a heat gun and unglue it. That would, you know, my, that's my personal preference. But I don't want right to repair legislation to push my personal preference for design on consumers or on companies. I just want it to be if you're going to glue something into the device, whatever it is, I'm willing to jump through all those hoops to, to fix it. But don't tell the company that made this part they're not allowed to sell it to me. That is, it's a good True. take. I like that take. Ultimately, tech is going to continue to evolve. And to us, of course, it looks much more complicated. But also, those who repair tech will also continue to evolve and continue to meet that particular challenge. So really what we need at the end of the day is well-written, well-considered legislation that does not allow that anti-consumer, anti-competitive, anti-repair behavior that we've seen from so many companies and that can preserve that ecosystem of right to repair. And then we can move forward with a better future. We deserve the right to repair the things we own. Simple as that. And by the way, yeah. the environment if you're like deserves holding that back too. Like the, we only the get- The only proprietary things that will fit in this thing and you're like, no, 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 you can't have it. You have to buy my new one. Yeah, that's bullshit.
and a lot one of them making sure you can't. Yeah, and no, last time exactly. I checked, a lot of these companies are painting themselves as uh, pretty green, like Apple and Tesla. And last time I checked, every John Deere tractor is pretty green, so we deserve that chance. So that's been it. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And big shout out to Ghost Rossman.